Okay, uh, welcome to the second talk um, for the day. Um, as the organizer of the Android Heads meetup group here in Vienna, I'm very happy to announce an Android talk now. So uh, Peter and Bernd are going to talk about developing a SDK for Android. Welcome to our talk, um, Developing a SDK for Android. Um, my name is Peter Riegler, and this is my colleague Bernd Bergler. We are both working at a startup based here in Vienna. It's called um, Wuhu Mobile Marketing. And besides that, we are also working as freelance developers, um, focusing on uh, Rails and Android applications. Um, so first of all, a little bit about uh, the company. Google Mobile Marketing, as I said, is based here in Vienna. We are dealing with mobile couponing. So um, offers, special offers we select with our um, selected retail stores. And you can show these offers on your smartphones and also um, go into the store and buy them in the store with just um, showing a coupon code uh, with your device. Um, first of all, we started with a single app solution. Um, after some time, we, real re we realized that this uh, single app does not attract too much users. So we had two options, and the one was um, to put a lot of money into the marketing, and the other solution was um, to build an, an SDK, provide this to developers out there. So th they put um, our library into their applications, and we attract much more um, customers than we can do just on our own. So yeah, and that's also the reason why we are going to give this talk today. Um, we want to share our experience, uh, our experiences we made uh, throughout the time. Um, it took us yeah, the last couple of months developing an Android library project containing all these, uh, these um, couponing codes. And as you might uh, already um, think of, this um, library also contained a lot of um, UI code, which is very unusual for, I think, most of the library li libraries out there. So yeah, pretty interesting about that. Um, the second of all, sorry. Um, the second of all, um, we think libraries are awesome. As a developer, we use libraries every day, but typically we just consume them. So it does not happen that often that we write our own libraries. So out of curiosity, um, who of you guys is uh, has ever developed an Android library uh, on his own before? Okay, interesting. And was it just for for yourself, or uh, did you also um, published it anywhere, open source or anything, for a community? Source. Just source. okay. Great. So yeah, I think, um, why not build our own library? And we're going to walk you through this process on how to do this during the time of this talk. So the first half will be um, a broad overview about the topic, how to get into it. And the second part uh, from my colleague Bernd will be a, lit, uh, a little bit more about advanced topics like testing stuff and how to deal with dependencies. <coughs> okay, so our agenda looks like uh, this. Um, we have touch points on nearly every phase of the development lifecycle of a typical software product. So this starts right from the beginning with the design phase. Um, a lot of important design decisions have to be made beforehand. We're t telling you a little bit about that. Um, then the coding happens pretty much the same, but what's pretty different is the handling of dependencies and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Um, yeah, then testing. Testing is obviously very, very important for libraries because um, any faulty behavior or bugs are not only affecting you, but all the developers using your stuff and their users um, will not be very happy about that. So do testing a lot. Um, the release, for obvious reasons, is also very different. Um, also depends on how you are um, going to plan to release your, your library. Um, and a uh, very important thing at the end, reporting of, of um, behavior of the code during the use. So I, I think most of you guys, when you publish an app, you're using something like Google, Google Analytics 
or some crash reporting like Crashlytics um, to get an awesome feedback on how your code behaves out there in the wild on millions of devices. But typically when you publish your library, the developers using your stuff won't give you this, this data. Um, so yeah, that's also a, a very big point that's different from conventional lab development. Good. So let's dive into it um, with um, one of the most important things, the design phase. And as Floor beforehand already um, stated out, the design is a very, very um, important part. And I would say when you're trying to build a library and you're designing the public API, so the main touch points for your, for your customers, you should spend really, really a lot of time and effort into these. Um, so um, why is this very important? First of all, because your, your customers are investing heavily when they use your API. So they have to learn how to deal with it. They have to write code to make it work in, in their projects. And, and this is one of the, the, the biggest um, efforts for them. So you can make them, you, make, you can make their life easier by providing a well-designed API. So if they, for example, um, figure out at the beginning that there are some major issues in your API, they won't even start using it. And if they're already into it, um, stop, it stop using a, a specific API can be very prohibitive. So yeah, a successful API obviously captures a customer for a pretty long time. So um, the public API is a thing you put out in the wild and then it's, um, it shouldn't change in any way. So you have um, one single um, chance to get it right and then the public API is forever. Um, that's why you should learn all the best practices out there. There are many, many um, very good um, sources of information about um, designing Java interfaces and designing public APIs in general. Um, so a few of the good readings um, are, are here. There's a very good starting point uh, a, a presentation by Joshua Bloch um, and very good um, information in, in books and, and websites. For example, I can really recommend the, the NetBeans wiki with a lot of, of good documentation about this whole design process. So during this presentation, I'm not going into any code details here. Um, we're just going to point out a few um, base things that your API should um, apply to. So first of all, it should be, for obvious reasons, um, be easy to learn. So as I, as I said before, you, your, cl your client, um, the developer who's implementing your API, shouldn't hassle around a lot of hours just dealing uh, with it and finding out how, how things work. So make it, make it easy as possible. Um, make it easy to use even without um, documentation. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of a contrast to the talk before. But um, if you have um, very good namings for your, for your method calls, it should be very obvious what this method does. And it shouldn't be necessary for the developer to look up everything in the documentation to find out um, what this special thing is, is for. Um, it should be also hard to misuse. This can be um, um, pretty tricky in certain cases. So um, you as, as the guy who is dealing with this stuff all the day are thinking in, in, in special directions. Um, so maybe try to um, get some other fellow de developers um, helping you in the design phase uh, with different viewpoints to figure out what they might uh, want to accomplish with it and, and figure out how certain things could possibly be go in a wrong direction. Um, yeah, it should be easy to, to read. Um, so it's some kind uh, similar to be easy to learn. Um, it should be easy to, to maintain and it should be um, just as powerful as it needs to be. So we as developer often tend to making cool, cool things working and often already implement things that we are not sure that will be even used out there. But yeah, it's, it's sometimes uh, things we tend to do. So stop this here and just put in the stuff that's really necessary. And it should be um, easy to extend because in future releases you might uh, want to add some certain um, functionality you didn't think about before that uh, became very, very important afterwards. So make sure your API is very uh, well designed to be extendable. And of course, appropriate for your audience. 
So um, when you start designing it, think about who is going to um, work with it. Is it for a special problem domain? Is it for a certain kind of developer, for just for intermediate and pros, or also for beginners? So all things you might want to consider here. Okay, some some hints we would give you on your way. Um, take really your time with this um, phase. So um, we would suggest the time you normally invest in designing and, and, and building the interface for something, uh, multiply it by three, and then you're somewhere near um, where you should be. Okay, um, yeah. This is also a very interesting thing you find in, in several sources. Um, if you think you're ready with your, with your API design, um, try to implement three different use cases on your own. You, um, very, very different use cases, the, the, the most different you can, you can think of, and try to accomplish certain thi things with your API. And if all of these three use cases can be accomplished with your API, then um, you can um, probably accomplish nearly all of them. Um, but the thing we figured out that even these three things, <laughs> these three different implementations, in many cases, uh, will not be enough. So in our case, we had to change the API after our first three um, client apps had been on our on our service. So yeah, that's probably a thing you don't want to have. And and we would suggest, if it's possible for you, um, if you have a few uh, fellow developers, uh, let them play around with it. Um, implement their use case they think of, and after three uh, of the of the following projects um, working with it, then include all the learnings you made and then make it uh, as a stable API. Um, yeah, and of course, as I said before, the API should be easy to easy to read and easy to use. And one of the most important things here is uh, naming and naming conventions. So uh, follow them and be consistent. Uh, so consistent in terms of um, the the um, uh, parameters um, that you give to a method in a certain order. Do this every time the same way, and of course this ends with um, um, naming every single piece of 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 of, of class or, or stuff um, throughout the whole project, always in the same way. Okay, um, when you start implementing uh, any library project or library in Android, you have two um, different options. First of all, you can distribute it as a Java file. Uh, we know Java files from the Java world. It's basically a binary, it's a zip format containing class files. Um, the integration is also pretty easy. You just copy it into the libs folder um, and it will be added to the class path and compiled as a dependency. Um, but, uh, Java files have one limitation, um, and that's a pretty huge one. You cannot include any um, resource files like XML resources or assets or anything. So if you happen to have any UI code inside your, inside your, your library, you're pretty much forced to go to a library project. A library project um, is one of the three main project types we have in Android, besides the, the standard Android projects and the test project. Um, its structure is also pretty similar. We have um, a manifest, we have a source and a, and a libs folder, we have resources and everything. So um, the main difference between a standard Android project and a library project is that it cannot be compiled by itself. So um, the main project, Android project, has to define um, its, um, its dependency to your library project and will then afterwards be compiled into that one. Um, one thing you have to be aware of, um, you can include um, UI code as you please uh, and, and Android components as you please, um, but you have to expose shared components in the manifest file of the, of the um, client uh, project. So if your, your client project has, for example, an activity that's um, originally from the, from the library project, you also have to define it in, in the main manifest file there. Good. Um, one very cool thing um, now with Android Studio and Gradle are AAR files. Um, you can package um, a library project into an AAR file, which is also 
pretty much a simple zip file containing all the all the stuff from the library project, and uh, really nice. You can then afterwards um, de uh, define these dependencies to this to these AR files in your Gradle file and just um, define this transient dependency like the line here on the bottom. So very nice way to handle with dependencies here. Um, yeah, fragmentation. We we all know about fragmentation and the fragmentation problems in Android. We have a lot of different kinds of fragmentation here. Um, fragmentations of the Android operating system. Um, there's the graph on the, on the top right corner um, from last month indicating um, all the different OS versions out there. Then we have fragmentations of different kind of processor types. Um, and we have fragmentation of different hardware manufacturers. Um, so how does, this, uh, how does that influence us on our development process here? Um, if you set the min SDK version of your, of your library, be aware that this will impact all your um, client projects because they also have to use uh, a min SDK version equal or higher to this one. So think about um, this very carefully. Think about which kind of projects are going to use your library and what min SDK version, version they might enforce. Then secondly, if you have any NDK um, uh, stuff, if you're using any NDK, um, be aware of um, compiling all the resources for all the different pr processor types and include that one into your, into your library as well. Um, and yeah, for testing, uh, testing on emulators is, is okay, but if you're doing any hardware uh, specific stuff like camera uh, access or anything, um, be sure to test it on real hardware devices beforehand. Uh, and, and, and ship it afterwards. So, yeah. Great, the next thing, um, making it open source or not making it open source um, depends first of all on your um, business model. So are you doing it just for, for the community? Do you have some cool stuff you want to give away? Um, or are you going to charge your clients for, for using your, your library? Um, then secondly, um, do you have, or do you think you have a, a certain benefit for the community? Because just releasing anything on, on, on GitHub won't bring you uh, much. You have to build up a community. This takes quite some effort. And, and companies often think if they put something out there, open, make it open source, um, a lot of programmers just will, will come to them and, and implement cool features, uh, extending their software and doing stuff with that but that's in the most cases not true. Yeah, um, what else? Um, think about your competition. What are they doing? Is there already open source um, solution out there? Does it make sense to make it open source? Um, uh, and you also have to think about uh, your libraries because um, when you're choosing libraries, um, think beforehand um, what, li what, what, um, what uh, licensing you you want to to make, and and choose your libraries according to that. So that's also the, the next point I want to point out: um, licensing. So um, what we would recommend you here is um, pick your your, your style, um, so proprietary or, or open source. And if you're not sure what you're doing, go to a, a very specialized um, um, lawyer and let you um, let enlighten you what's the best fitting solution for you here yeah good um, and the last part from my talk is about um, semantic versioning so um, similar to standard um, software products it's a very good idea to have a specific way of, of, of de defining a version number for your project one very, very um, simple approach is semantic versioning. It's in some ways pretty strict, um, but it works pretty well um, also for, um, to work with, with machines or uh, to work with package manager tools. Um, so um, yeah, you already know the three numbers, major, minor, and patch. And the specific rules um, point out that you always have to increase the major number if you're doing any breaking changes to your public API. So this is pretty strict here, 
And that's also why you have to think about very carefully when you're going out with your um, first major release, um, 1.0.0, because after that, every break will increase the major number. Second of all, the minor number. Um, you should increase that one if you're adding any additional features um, that are not influencing backward compatibility and are not breaking anything. And last but not least, um, patch the patch number, which is intended to be increased for bug fixes and, and um, improvements, um, but they are not really uh, bringing in any, any additional or new, new features, new stuff. And yeah, there's uh, a little bit of more information about to handle that on this address here. So I would suggest reading in there a little bit and figuring that stuff out. So um, that's all from my side. And I'm giving the word to my colleague, Bernd Berger, who will continue with dealing with dependency. So everyone knows dependencies libraries are very awesome to Im implement new features easily into your application. But if you're dealing with um, libraries, it's not so good to have many dependencies because they bloat up your, your library. And if you have transient dependencies which use other dependencies, you, you get a really large library itself. Um, so our recommendation is to keep the file size and the method counts for your um, library as small as necessary. So for instance, um, every, or some of you might know the, the last um, Google Play Services library, which went out, I don't know, two months month ago, they ha had 25,000 method calls. So, and in Android, you have the, the text limit for 65,000 method, methods. So if you use this library, your whole application code is just allowed to have 45,000 methods, which is a lot, but if you use another large libraries or have a huge application, that, that might be a problem. So look, look out for your developers, which use a library and don't bloat their apps. Um, if you have to use dependencies, th um, you have usually three easy ways, three ways to, to include those dependencies into your library. Um, the first one is to repackage the existing library into your, your namespace uh, and ship it with your, as part of your library, which is handy because you, have, you ca can be sure that you have no conflicts, conflicting libraries with the application itself, but they increase your library and even so more so if the developer itself uses the same library, then they, they got included twice into the same project. Um, the second part is um, force the developer to include a library which you might use, um, which is not nice, but sometimes necessary. And the third one is to, for some common libraries like the support library, you can often um, expect the library to have included the, this library um, beforehand, so you can just use it. But here, um, you have to be careful, because if they include another version, then you expect that this might lead to problems. So you have to test for which spe specific version they, they might using, and which version you expect, and act accordingly, which version is um, present. Um, the next part is testing. Testing Android applications is not so fun, but if you're deploying and releasing an, an, an SDK or a library, you have to test it. You have to be sure that everything works as expected. You don't want to break the code of your, your customer, the developer. You don't want to, to crash the application in some kind of weird way. So you have to test everything twice. You have to, it, it's a good practice, you have to, or it's good to to use the, the good practices of testing, like unit testing, business logic, and small, small blocks of your application, but as well using integration testing to, to make sure the whole, the whole concept of your app is working. Um, 
for the business logic, you can use Roboelectric to start um, or to, to make the tests fast and run on your machine. Or if, if you have written your, your SDK in a, in a specific way, you don't need the Android specific code, you can use just JUnit and get really fast unit tests. Um, for integration testing, you can use Espresso, which is a really cool library, which helps you a lot in integration testing. Um, complex um, user, user interaction and, and user elements. Um, yeah. Then another important part is use continue, continuous integration if possible. So you get your instant feedback while you're developing your SDK and get um, instant response when you're breaking the tests. Um, if you support s multiple versions, um, test all the versions similar. You have to set up multiple test projects for your SDK, which might be, be um, out there in the, in the real um, environment, which, which, which um, ways your app, your SDK might be used. So if you instance have support for different versions of the library, test every, each and every one of them. Um, you have to make sure if you support Android 2.3, you have to support or you have to test against all versions, all sizes. And it works really good, or we found a nice tool, which is Spoon, which gets you screenshots and really cool um, uh, status reports where which tests crashed on which um, devices and the according screenshot how the the test looked. So just if the test is green doesn't mean it, it, it's working on that device. Just you have to visually check if the, the your SDK looks good. Um, and all supported options or libraries which um, gets included into your SDK. So the next part, release preparation. Y you, your application is, or your SDK is ready. You've tested it, you, kn you know it's working, but how do you get it out, out there? Um, if, you, if you have the, the luxury of, you can have an open source library, you just push it to GitHub and it's, it's out there. Everybody can, can build it, but if you have a closed, closed uh, commercial license, you probably want to obfuscate your code, which is not supported by the standard tools. So you have to, and a library project usually includes the, 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 the source code. So it, during the build process, it gets built alongside with the app. So if you want to include <coughs> um, the pro guarded source, you have to take your source, link all the dependencies which get included or not included, and then make an, an obfuscated char file, which is then a li library to your own library project. And this gets then included into the actual um, developer project. So if you, you have created your zip file, your, your oh no, sorry. Um, other parts of the release preparation are you have to write documentation if you just, no, no developer just downloads your SDK and f wants to figure out how it's working. You have to provide documentation, what, what is going, how is it going, preferable a few sample, samples, how, how he can um, um, include your SDK into his, his, his um, application or or his, yeah, his application. And another important part is you have, it's good to provide a feedback mechanism where the developer, if he runs into issues, where he can contact you, um, it, um, post issues, so an issue tracker or something would be nice to have. And if you, if you have some kind of authentication with your, with the backend, with your backend or so, you have to have a mechanism to provide API keys and authentication for your, for your developers. So everything is done and now the release day is coming. 
but how do you release it? Uh, the first, if, if you have a Gradle build and you're building an, an AAR file, you can, you just push it to, or you push it, push it to a Maven repository. You have the possibility to, to make it make yourself hosted. So your developer just have to include your Maven repository as a repository and can just use it or use Sonar type or Maven central, which are supported out of the box by the Gradle build. But if you're not, um, not um, providing an AR file, you you're have to pu put out your library pro project in some form. We, we um, um, prepared the, the zip file on our own servers, so the developer has to go to our website, download it, and then extract it into his project, which is <coughs> a bit of a hassle, but it's the easiest way to provide access for the developer, or for us, to the developer. And if you have open source, you can just publish the source code and pu push it to GitHub, Bitbucket, whatever. But you can, could also, if you have um, open source, you can also push it to, to Maven Central or other parts. Um, now the SDK we developed, it's like Peter said before, it's a mobile couponing application or SDK, which allows the user to to, to earn points points during in the app and use these points for purchasing or getting coupons for for the offers. Um, we had a user interface with action bar and, and which is not so common in libraries. Um, we had a, a backend interface with a, a backend server with a REST interface and we offered a clean and simple API for the developers. Um, on the next slide you see um, that's the whole code we, we provide or that, that's most of our in interface. You just register um, your API key, what your current should, name should be, you get a context, and then you just say get balance to, to get the balance which, which the user have. And then if the user clicks on the offer, just show offers and, 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 and our SDK takes over. So how does it look like? Um, here you see the, the offer screens in the SDK, which, um, which are the, the four steps. The first step is the, the user have a list, have a list of different offers. The next one is the detail screen where you get um, additional information to the offer. Wh where is it? How much does it cost? How long is the offer valid? And if the user decides to, to purchase it, um, he gets the coupon screen wh which where a, a, a code is displayed and which then gets scanned at the the purchase point from the retail, from our partner. The next part is a short video where you see the whole interaction. Okay, no, you don't see it's on the wrong screen, sorry. <laughs> but, can I zoom in here? can see the, the user plays a game. It's an external application from a third party developer and he just had has now 38 coins and now he can use those coins. Here he um, can select from different categories, online offers, offline offers and choose different categories. With different project products, and he, he, he then if he wants to or his, if he selects an offer which he likes, he sees the 
the additional information, like I said before, the conditions, and then he can redeem the offer and get, get the coupon to be able to purchase the offer. Then he can increase the size and validate the coupon so he just re received the, the bonus. Okay, now that's our SDK, and so what were the challenges we we encountered during the the development? Um, the first challenge was how do you authorize non-registered customers with the web API? The second one was we have multiple screens but we don't want the developer to have to include multiple activities into his manifest, so we put all of the screens into each fra in different fragments and included it into one activity. And how do you support um, different action bar libraries in one, in one library? The first, the network request, um, we had to, or we wanted to use HTTPS because of security and other reasons. Um, how how do we, did we authenticate the user? For each installation of the, of the SDK, we generated a unique identifier and generated device token identifier which gets mm, signed with a secret where as well the package name of the application gets signed. So in, in this case, we, we can ensure that even if the, another rogue developer gets the, the secret of the secret and API key of the developer, it's not possible that he can um, use our SDK to pretend to be another developer, which was the main focus from our authentication. And we can revoke API keys so they don't, don't have access to the um, to our offers anymore. Um, the second one was the single activity. Um, we used nested fragments to, to be able to provide the, the, the experience we, we would like to. But the main challenge was how do you restore state in nested fragments into one activity and the trans transitions between screens within nested fra fragments. Um, why? Why did we do that? Like I said, it, we wanted to make it th easy for the developer to, to, to include our SDK and just have to um, include one um, activity in the manifest. And the third and last ma major challenge we had was the action bar. Um, I think most of you are aware that there are three different action bars out there. The, the action bar which comes directly with Android since 4.0, the action bar compat library from Google itself, and the action bar Sherlock implementation from Jack Wharton. Um, we as a developer, we don't know which or if any library the developer uses. So we didn't want to support all three of them separately and do nasty things. So we just um, took the, the open source um, action bar compat library, stripped down the part which, which we, we're need, needing and shipped our own implementation so which does not in interfere with the other things. It, it worked really well, but it was quite a hassle to get it to working with all the refactorings. And so it really does not interfere with any action bar library in any version. Um, yeah, other learnings we had, respect Murphy's law, everything that can goes wrong will goes wrong. Um, if you, your developers are usually lazy. If they have activities declared in their manifest, they just copy it and, and change the name. If they have properties on their ac activities so far, they just let them there and don't know, even if they don't know if they might cause problems. So assert that there are 
configurations which you allow and which you don't allow and ac act accordingly. It took us quite a while to figure some some bugs out because in the library you don't have um, you ca can't use really really cool things like crashlytics or analytics because if your developer use it, what who who get the reports? So we 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 decided not to use crashlytics and maybe roll our own in in the future, but so far we didn't. Um, yeah, then if you if you have XML layouts in your in your library project, your developer can change them at will. If you don't want the, the developer to change your layouts because they have to be to be in a specific form format, you have to code the layouts in in Java, which is really fun, like everybody knows. And yeah, test your code like you would not do in an in an app because testing is fun. Okay, the summary. Um, choose the right um, packaging type. If you if it's working for you, if you don't have resources, you can use the char file, which makes a lot easier than if you have to use a library project. Um, never trust the developer. Um, testing is important. Then open source your library if it makes sense, if it's in compliance with your business model. And keep your API stable and don't annoy your customers. Um, for more information about our SDK, you just go to woohoomobile.com slash developers. And thank you for your attention. And any questions? Um, on the one, one, high, one, one hand, you can um, differentiate your between your customers because in your app, your develop, your users can use the points they, they, they gained in the in the game to exchange against real real coupons. And on the other hand, if a purchase happens during in, within your app, you get the reward share from us. So. If, the, if your users, if you have a lot of users and they're active and buying stuff, you get a, uh, uh, a market or a share from the from the purchase from us. It's so far just in Austria, okay. but we're working on it to get it to more countries. The question was, how, how do you, the, did we think about localica localization? Yeah. In a library project, the developer himself can add um, localizations if he wants to. So if, if his language is Spanish and we don't provide a Spanish localization, he can add it from himself. We, we provide the library, yeah. Okay. And for us, it, it, we, we, we support so far German and English. And as soon as we hit another market, we have to update the, the SDK as well, and then it, 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 it gets the localization for the new market. Any other questions or 
everyone satisfied with our information. Um, the barcode is product specific, so so the the our 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 partners upload the the barcode into our backend, and then he, he can um, and then it gets shipped to the to the application. So, it, but we we support different form factors. So we we EAN QR text to and other different barcode types. Um, so the question was, how do we control the points? Um, we don't. Uh, it's, it's up to the developer. We have guide, guidelines how much points he should give for which amount of, of playtime or retention. But it's up to the developer. So, and but w w if we see the developer is just handing out points, like, yes. like, no, like no, we just we we could send them messages and might block them for a few days. So. Okay. Do future Android versions factor into your development for the SDK? Like when you, when you develop an SDK or library, are you concerned with upcoming features or do you develop just for the existing? We, we did not factor any, or the question was if we take it into account future releases or of Android, um, so far we didn't, but if they, we we might produce updates which act accordingly to the to the new um, Android versions. So it just it's it's working on on, on 4.4 plus uh, 4.4 as, as a base thing, but we support up back to 2.3. So what's another question? Um, the question was, how did we? Uh, what's our strategy to get the developers on board? Um, we give talks about SDK development at <laughs> at conferences, um, but it's tough. Yeah, we we focus on the mobile gaming, ga mo mobile games, which because they have they they, they have a good fit with our um, SDK because they have points and the user retention, but it, it's tough to get the developers, which is another challenge. So we don't have a really we really strategy except just networking and meeting people and but thank you. Question about about your there's do you have specific partnerships with the vendors? Yes. Or uh, do they contact you or how do you contact them? Um, the question was um, if we have specific yeah. partnerships, partnerships or what's the strategy? Um, yes, we have um, in Austria. We have Hervis, Sport, Sports Direct, Konrad, Kastner and Öhler, Gigasport. So we 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 just have uh, we we just um, have cooperations with those partners. Usually we 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 sell them our product where we just went went to them and just say, hey, we have got this cool product, and and they then say yes, we we would like to. And they they have a back end where they could could themselves uh, register the, their coupons and say we want to um, make them available in this venue or that venue <coughs> for that many users. So you approached them. Yes, but we, we we got for from from others we got, we got approached. It's it's working both ways. So okay. others heard from us and we got approached, but m most of the time they we 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 go to them and. One last question. Um, the question was, if you have to pay for a service, no, it's it's free for developers. Okay. And if you have any other questions, just we're outside.
and just, just talk to us.